Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Use the chat as you tune in to let us know where you're joining us from. I'm in Seattle. Allison's in New York. Joshua is in Portland. New York City, hello. Welcome. When we reach sort of critical mass of people tuning in, we will get started, but we'll give it a minute or two here. Seattle, excellent. Alexandria, Virginia, Boston, welcome. Brooklyn. Leavenworth, Washington, Boston again. Happy holidays to you too from Dallas. Philadelphia, oh, you left Seattle. Vancouver, BC, hello. Juneau, Alaska. New Orleans, welcome. All right. We'll give this just a second and we'll get started. This is the best, one of the, one of my favorite parts of doing these is just seeing where you're all from. All right. That's looking good. I think we will go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington. It's called Book Larder. We have just started to do some in-person author events and uh, cooking classes in the shop, just a few um, as things start, start to sort of, sort of hopefully return to normal. But for the time being, we are doing the, the majority of our author talks here on Zoom. And the great part of that is that we can do talks like tonight, where you get to join us from all over the place and our interviewers in one city, our authors in another, and I'm in another, you know, a conversation we might not have been able to have otherwise. So we'll see the positive uh, where we can find it. Tonight, we are, of course, celebrating Joshua McFadden's wonderful new book, Grains for Every Season. It is his second cookbook. Um, all full of amazing recipes for using grains in both savory dishes and baking and pasta making and pizza and all kinds of wonderful ways. He is going to be in conversation with author Allison Roman. They are going to talk about the book, but of course they will also leave time for your questions. So if you could please just use the Q&A button for any questions that you might have. You can use that chat section to talk to each other, but if you have a question, please use the Q&A. And there are quite a few of you tuning in tonight, so we'll get to as many questions as possible. Um, and I apologize in advance if we don't get to them all. You can support the talk by purchasing a copy of the book from Book Larder. I will drop a little link into uh, the, or excuse me, into the chat so that it's easy for you to find. And thank you to everyone who's done that already. Joshua was kind enough to sign a whole lot of books for us. And so um, we will have signed copies while those are still available. All right, so let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Allison Roman and Joshua McFadden. Hello. Hi. We didn't, that, that was not as smooth as, as I had hoped. <laughs> drum, yeah, drum roll. How's it yeah. going? <laughs> Good, how are you? How okay. going? Good, it has been so long since I've seen you in person. Um, a million years and so long since I've been to where you live or where you have been to where I live and that's a huge bummer mm -hmm. um so congratulations on this beautiful new book um I feel like you are one of the authors that is like so it's like so hotly anticipated that people like it's like a collector's item because like the oh, way um, that you, yeah the way that you make well, for me that's pretty like, amazing so, yeah thank you it's a good, I mean, I, it's a good thing to be, but I feel like when people know that they're getting a new book from you, um, it's going to be very special, even though like, I guess this is your own, only your sixth one, but the first one I felt like was so robust and full of so much that people were able to live with it for so long without getting bored, which I think is like a beautiful hallmark of a, of a cookbook. Oh, thank you for those kind words. That's amazing. You're so welcome. Um, I want to know, well, first I want to know how, how are you? I'm doing well, you know, uh, we're all figuring this thing out. I'm happy that it's the holidays. Uh, restaurants are slowly opening back up. We actually just reopened uh, the Woodsman Tavern. I don't know if you remember that from back in the day. I absolutely do. Yeah, wow. That's cool. We bizarrely uh, just reopened that 
a week ago today and that feels really good it's really uh very nostalgic and just like the perfect thing for the times right now Mm -hmm. um so that's that's the thing that's got me going the most at the moment yeah that's amazing yeah I feel like it has it's like the per the quintessential Portland restaurant from when I went there for the first time like eight years ago or something that's like we've got to go there yeah, it really is. And it's very familiar to a lot of things in New York. I mean, I think that's where the original inspiration was from Dwayne back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been really fun to just kind of um, not do much to it, but just kind of like pull back some layers and then just like make it really, really dark. <laughs> yeah, great. It's a seafood heavy menu and uh, just keeping it very, very simple. Well, it's like an old throwback to like an old steakhouse where you're like, what side would you like? And I just, I think that that's, exactly what we need where it's not challenging we are not reinventing the wheel we're just making sure that oysters are cold and wines are delicious and bringing back the bistro burger i think that's probably the only thing we're doing but you guys have been doing that forever in new york so yeah that's probably the only place where we disagree that like that's just not my jam but i will go there for seafood and oysters all day so you don't like burgers what was the whole thing i remember i remember blocking this out the first time i told you told me. <laughs> you're like you deleted my phone number um <laughs> Yeah, no, I just, I don't like, the burgers are too thick in a bistro burger. I, a smash burger all day, I'm down for that. But it's like the, the bistro burger where it's like, like the Luger burger, like it's just too much meat. It's too I much know, meat. I know. I think, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I, I like them both. I don't think that you can sit down and eat a whole one, but I think it's really nice to like share one and yeah. it really shows the quality of the meat. And that's the whole reason I like them. I remember that's you saying meat. that before. There was something else that you had said really funny that I couldn't believe. Sandwiches, you don't like sandwiches? again too much stuff in there i don't i don't is like is that the one i'm starting to remember it now <laughs> it is sandwiches well burger sandwich you, you see where i'm going it's it's like too much stuff within a thing yeah no, so no. but one thing we can both agree on pizza um and vegetables and grains we, we love all three of those things and seafood I, i'd say like overall every other thing we align on I, I, I think your food is so crazy good. And oh, not that. only, I guess, well, before I had even eaten your food in person, I, when I was at Bon Appetit, I was testing a recipe that you had written for a salad that involved you like whipping cream and then adding lemon juice to it. And then like, it was like on the base of the salad. I think that, I mean, I know that was yours, but I forget what year that was. It was a million years ago, like eight years ago. I was like, damn, I was like, this is exactly how I want to eat. And there was like the salad that's in six seasons with like the celery and the dates and the Parmesan. And I was like, Oh yeah, this is my, like, this is my style. This is my jam. And I feel like, I mean, I'm sure I'm, you have this experience too, when you go to a restaurant or you're eating somebody's food and you sort of click with them and you're like, I bet we'd be friends. For sure. (laughs) And it turns out we are, um, turns out we became friends, but, um, but yeah, your food is like just as delicious in the restaurant as it is. I think when people cook from it from the books, which is why your books are so popular. what I want to sort of know like the process behind how you I guess it's like a two-part question but because you're making restaurant food and then you're also making like restaurant food for the home cook or home cooked food like how do you sort of determine when you think of something does it belong in a restaurant does it belong in a cookbook and sometimes it's both and like Mm -hmm. how you translate those recipes to work in both places or one or the other that's a great question um you know, I think way back when we first met, it was because um, Ava Jeans was nominated one of the top 10 best new restaurants. And during that time, as everyone goes through that is fortunate enough to have that experience, there's a lot of people that call you up and like, hey, and there's literally like three emails, voice messages that are just like, would you like to write an Ava Jeans book? And I just always thought that was so funny. And I would just write back, I'm not even sure if it's going to be here in a year. <laughs> you're like you know how restaurants work this yeah. is I'm like, so, uh, let, me check, let me like let me check no and I always loved love books and I was always really inspired by like River Cottage River Cafe and like British books from back in the day and you know I just met the right person and people that kind of got that I didn't want to do a restaurant book and I really kind of wanted to explain the things that I had learned in the previous like 10, 15 years of just um, watching it change. I mean, I remember being at, you know, standing in kitchen arts and letters back in the day and probably like 2003 when I was working at Franny's and like asking for a book about seasons. And they, he literally handed me that year's uh, New Jersey farmer's almanac. Like there was nothing to reference 
like when things were happening. And it's like, that had been my only and all of my training coming from, you know, school in, in Portland to working in San, or, uh, working in San Francisco and then working in Chicago and then in New York. And I mean, that was obviously the thing that had been going on in restaurants for a, a long period of time, but it just, there's been so much positive change in the last 20 years mm-hmm. um, and more farmer's market and more awareness. And I think right when Ava Jeans had opened, I kind of had realized that I always kind of, um, ex- you know, felt and explained it like, you know, my dad was always like, what are you doing? You're moving to some restaurant to do so-and-so and you want to do what? And he just didn't totally ever get it, but he loves food. Every time I'd bring him to a restaurant, he would love those restaurants. Um, and growing up in Wisconsin and him living in Wisconsin is just a very different opportunity to be able to go out and do those things. So he's not as familiar. So it was always kind of in the back of my head of trying to explain that idea. And then the other idea was like, you know, when you go to a restaurant and you sit down and there's always somebody at the table, it's like, you know, oh, I'd love to see the wine list. And they just geek out about it and they know it. And they're like, you know, getting so excited about it. And then the server will come back over and be like, oh, can I get some wines? And there's just, there's always somebody that knows and there's always somebody that has no idea and doesn't know why the other person has all this information. Mm-hmm. And that's always the really important thing for me was like, it's okay, we don't know. You go to the supermarkets and there's pineapples like all year long and all these, and all these things. So I just like really wanted to like scratch away at that information and provide that information was, was the only goal. So it's a long winded way of saying I never really even remotely thought about the restaurants as the thing that I was trying to express. It's always been yeah. very, very different. Yeah. They didn't connect in that way. Um, what was the process then like for you to kind of like start to articulate your thoughts in a really broad way and then also collaborating with people that were going to help you tell that story like what what is that process like uh well collaborating I mean these books wouldn't even be written if it wasn't for Martha that's simple as it gets um so when we met that was that felt really good because there was actually somebody that I felt that I could work with trust and would inspire me to like get to that point of where we're trying to get to with a recipe that wasn't about a restaurant Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't about my experience of being a chef and it was really about like just empowering home cooks so I was never trying to make it too fussy and was always excited when she got excited because I knew we were on something that was right and there was very few times when I'd ever have to like bring in or, or kind of fuss with anything so that kind of kicked off the process and then it just slowly started um happening and understanding that like my experiences probably working on a farm definitely have outweighed the idea of me working in restaurants with an understanding of vegetables and I remember having you know spring carrots and all these different things that you wouldn't think that are readily available and have those moments and those things change throughout the year and you know carrots were a perfect example of like the sugar just gets sweeter and they become like candy carrots is the joke and so I was just always trying to like scratch at those ideas of um, when things are great and then like when things are not even though they're still around doesn't mean we need to like continue celebrating they could be turned into sauces or pickles or different things they're not they're not necessarily at their prime of being like a raw ingredient in my opinion mm-hmm. so it was just kind of always really trying to figure that out and distill that down to its simplest point how did that differ from the first book which was more vegetable focused and this book which is obviously more green focused uh it was uh, it had zero connections. It was hilarious because when I started off writing this, I was very inspired and to try to figure out yet again, like, what is it? There's more of it at, you know, more grains at farmer's markets, more freshly milled flowers. There's just more and more things that are happening. And uh, I quickly realized that everything that I just said to you, I was wrong on with this because as I was trying to provide information it was like okay so now do I make a farro salad that has like asparagus and walnuts in it and then people are like oh I know how to cook with with farro and then so they go and grab asparagus 12 months out of the year and walnuts and make this salad so I was like I kept trying to say like I need help I need help like this isn't working in this way and it kind of drove certainly Martha and everyone crazy of just being like we need to figure out how to provide enough information that people understand what it is and provide seasonal moments and ideas of adaptations but not provide every single moment of a recipe throughout the six seasons or whatever we were trying to do so that in itself took a good bit of time to kind of understand what was what and also the excitement of just for milled flowers as well I mean it's very easy to like 
you know, it's a book about grains. Well, it's like, well, I see them the same because that's when I really started getting excited about them was when they were coming into Abogenes and we would mill them into pastas or all kinds of mm -hmm. breads. And it was just like, that was the connection that was creating the interest in understanding or wanting to understand the flavor or like where these are coming from because these are different than what I was used to. Yeah, I think that in the last few years, there's been like a huge awakening on like grains as aside from just like a cooked thing in a bowl, right? And it's a slippery slope where it starts with things like quinoa, but the flavor of them, I feel like if you ask somebody what like rye tastes like, if you're like, oh, this pasta is made with rye flour, they're going to think of it as like rye bread. And you're like, well, that's actually a caraway flavor. Rye okay. is the thing and it tastes like this and sort of like expanding on that. So like when it comes to sort of like those classic, not pairings, but like the things that people think of when they think of rye or like barley, you think of like mushroom barley soup. Like I feel like grains have this really like stodgy reputation and people are really locked into what they think of when they hear specific names of them. Um, and some things that are grains that you didn't know were grains. Um, but like, what is your approach to sort of like, I guess like we were just talking about the education of it without getting too scientific about like, the germ and then this and like well on like I'm sure you get into like hauled and unhauled and pearled and like all that stuff which I find very helpful as a recipe developer um but the like divorce of your food memory from a grain flavor because most people don't actually know what the grain tastes like alone it's it's combined with something and that's how they determine it tastes right I think I would I would probably go with it I'm I'm more interested in the way that it smells first I think like from toasting or different things that you're doing, you actually kind of start to understand like where you're going with it and what flavor you might be able to achieve. Um, but there's many things about grains that I'm even more confused about now. <laughs> After you like scratch the surface, it's just like, I remember somebody the other day, like being like, well, what's your favorite, you know, grain now? Like, you know, it was everyone's favorite question when the vegetable book came out, like, well, what's your favorite vegetable? And, yeah, impossible. Uh, it's impossible, yeah. Uh, and, and I was like, why well, I'm most inspired by, um, buckwheat right now. And the person's like, well, it's not really grain. I'm like, I know tomato, tomato, I mean, <laughs> seed, but like still like, yeah, it's tough. Like what is a grain? What is a fruit? We, yeah. we simply don't know. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. very confusing colloquially, um, the way that things are presented. Yeah. Um, but I would never ask you what your favorite grain is now, but I would ask you, mm -hmm. Like, was there anything in the process of the book where you sort of like, like an old technique you had forgotten about or something that you stumbled upon along the way where you're like, oh damn, that's actually a really cool application for this specific grain that like I forgot about or that you hadn't thought about before. You know, I think toasting, I think that, that, as I just said, like the smell, and if you have the time to do that, I remember actually a, a friend and a cook that was working alongside me at Franny's way back in the day was, you know, we were toasting the farro and we did it for like 15 minutes. I mean, it was like the darkest, like it was like coffee looking. And then when you act, when we actually started cooking it, it just completely changed the texture and the profile from that. So I think that if, and when there's time to do that, I think that it's unbelievable. And you can really with like monitor it with a slow heat and just, you know, sit there and drink a glass of wine and just stir, stir away and have a conversation. And I think it's, it's really truly is a game changer because it's just again the smell it smells up the whole house and it's just a different color and it just kind of changes the texture a little bit and it's that's the thing I kept going back to yeah I noticed that it, do, it does change the texture I feel like it like does something to the hull and it makes it cook differently like either quicker it's or like more sturdy it's almost like more sturdy like it has a different think so? I think so I feel like it has more of like a like a chew to it that's that's um really I find enjoyable hmm what do you think of, what do you, do you, what's your stance publicly on hulled or pearled grains? I have no opinion. No opinion. No. That fe I feel like that means you have one, but it's fine. Yeah, I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Um, I, I have a problem with them. <laughs> you didn't yeah. ask, but um, they, they, because when you're writing a recipe for a grain, your intention is the grain. And then when it's hauled, it, the cook time is way different and it absorbs water differently. So the recipes don't work. That's my only challenge with a hulled or pearled barley. If anybody on this chat works for big pearled barley, please let me know. Um, 
What is the sort of process that you enjoy the most of making these books, which, I mean, it could have changed from the first one to the second one, but I imagine like the conception of, okay, like, what do you want this to be? And to your point, it can get really muddy along the way. You're like, wait, how, what are we trying to say? Like, all of a sudden this is like four books worth of information, like how, like, you know, and then there's the photos, which also feels like a completely different project sometimes. Like, I guess, like, how long did this book take you to make? And in this specific book, what was your favorite part of the process? Mm, it took longer just because of uh, the world we're in right now. Um, and both of them, and I would imagine you probably agree, is like, there's just a, has to be a level of discovery along the way. I mean, it's like, at least for me, like, I don't want to outline it, which is going to drive everyone absolutely crazy. <laughs> Um, and I definitely want to be in a more like non-linear version of discovering what the ideas and the 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 fun things along the way that are actually creating the the actual spontaneity and make it special, I think, and trying to like mm -hmm. harness harness that as opposed to um, regimen like this, this, and this. Um, but that again drives people crazy. So I'm often very inspired during a shoot to have different versions of things um, as I'm making things. And, and that's definitely probably for sure not normal, <laughs> um, you know, for, for, the, for the photographer or Silas or anyone involved, even Martha, just like getting something that's like different than what it was supposed to be. But um, it's all I know how to do, it works. It's just kind of like continue pushing that creative idea to make it Yeah, better. I imagine it's very challenging. I mean, I, I sort of feel like I do this on some level, but I think also because it's so different than working in restaurants and like when you're cooking, even at home for yourself, the ability to just change sort of on the fly and like riff and be like, oh, we don't have this. We're going to use that. And that's a happy mistake. I actually prefer it. But when you're writing a recipe, you're sort of locked into something which can feel very stifling when you're like, okay, well, I guess I'm writing this recipe, you know, for farro and asparagus and walnuts. And you're like, well, it could also be done with fennel and be just as good, but I'm basically choosing one. And like, you're saying, this is the, this is the recipe. No, and I know. It actually and doesn't matter. That's a difficult place to be. And I think that we, you know, we did a really good job um, this time around because of, of what we're talking about with these foldouts. Um, Will you show us? I don't have the, the physical copy. I'm trying to find one. Um, and the foldouts came to be because of that idea that we're talking about and circulating around with the asparagus. Um, so this is like a grain bowl idea. Mm -hmm. And it gives you like the basics and what you're looking for and how and why and when. And then it folds out into this chart Good that, Lord. that allows you to like start thinking about, you know, this, <laughs> the six seasons. And then, um, you know, kind of isolating those things that the acid in a dish, the fat in a dish, the texture in a dish, like the herbs, like those type of things. So you have like the baseline that is farro, and then you have a vegetable that is asparagus, and that's an on and on and on. Acid, lemon, herbs, mint, you know, another mm -hmm. flavor with scallions. So we kind of did an interesting job of trying to help um, kind of explain that, you know, there's really no wrong way and you're going to learn if you don't, mm -hmm. if something isn't good, which I think is also a very important part of what we do to be able to get people off into the boat and sometimes they lose the oar and then they have to swim back so i think we did a good job of that this is another one that's really fun just like talking about pizzas mm -hmm. and just kind of allowing people to like really go into this whole idea of like in my opinion three ingredients for a dish or a pizza is always the, the best and i think that figuring out what that star is and then figuring out how you're getting to that point is I think the goal always and pulling things back. So I think we're trying to do that and provide that level of information for a recipe that people can figure out how to add to or what that idea is so they can do it again with other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just as much inspiration, I feel like, as it is education for specific grains, like what they do, what they taste like. And then also sort of the flexibility of them. Right. I feel like a lot of people, so, you know, when you hear the term grain and you think, okay, it's a book on grains, I'm sure most people wouldn't expect to see such like robust pasta and pizza chapters, but they are, they're effectively like nothing without the grain. And exactly. I feel like most people's foray into grains is like they're picking up a bag of something and cooking it, you know, for a bowl or like over, 
you know, salmon or something or under salmon, but that like inclusion of them, I feel like really, it makes the book that much more appealing, obviously, but also just that more interesting because, you know, your pizza is only good as the crust and your pasta is only good as the flour you're making the pasta with. And so talking a lot about that. Um, but what was your sort of like, I don't know. I could also see those things being completely left out, right? There's so much grains are involved in so much of what we do and, and eat, so much, and how we yeah. cook. but how important was that for you? You're like, no, we obviously pasta and pizza. Cause I feel like those could be their own books. It's funny. You say that. Um, <laughs> are you making a pizza pasta book? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, you know, the obvious thing that one would think if they picked it up right away, I would imagine would be that it would be, salad based with grains um, and that is in there and but and that's in there in a way of like teaching learning and understanding how to do those things but I got really inspired by just like granola or um, you know pilafs and all these different things that I had kind of have done in the past and I've always kind of been around but never really um, thought about as a grain um, even something as ridiculous as overnight oats which is so delicious and so simple but and so rewarding if you're really using really great greens and like thinking seasonally and adding really fun things to them. So it was kind of a, a big mixture of all things considered. Mm -hmm. Overnight oats. Never thought I'd hear the words overnight oats come out of your mouth. No, I, well, I never thought that I would either, but <laughs> I eat them all the time and they're delicious. And it turns out they're a grain. So there they like, are overnight oats. Thank yeah. you a lot. Do you have any other spreads in the book that you want to show us that you're especially excited about? um well we already did the pizza that one was uh that's a whole thing <laughs> yeah uh no also I, I just i'm sure it's not lost on everybody tuning in but the ability to distill that type of information is so difficult and you do such a great job of making right. it like fit on the page and so your designers as well and, and martha right. like making sure that it all fits without going on. It's very like magazine-y in, in that you're like, okay, we have this much space to give you this much information. Um, so those spreads are very clever. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, I think I've always been inspired by magazines. And I think, that, mm -hmm. I think that, that when you're able to provide more information than somebody thinks that they actually want, but you can also like kind of put over on the side, like this is all the information that you need. So when they get excited, they can find that other information or they don't have to. And I, I've always, I always kind of like going a little bit overboard and adding suggestions or seasonal changes or just, you know, what to do with leftovers or whatever. I think it's, I think it certainly helps. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's really easy for us to just kind of, as you're cooking, to do something and change it up. Right. Other people, it's not. Yeah. I feel that. Wait, you're going to show us another spot. Was I? I don't know. I really like the, just the fields. I think that's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the photographer went up in an airplane and, and shot um, uh, grain fields. Where were the where were those shot? Up in uh, Washington. There was a okay. lot of grain fields. Um, where is most of the grain the grain the growing is, happening? Uh, up in Washington. This is another one. This is something that I like really love, which is, is basically like a fun stir fries. Um, so that was, that was always one of the like, uh, cornerstones of the book was trying to figure out how to, um, use that information. Cause that is something I just been doing forever and ever and ever, which is just having grains around and then quick sautés of whatever's around. Um, mm -hmm. so that was a big thing, but to go back to your other question, um, there's a lot growing up in Washington and kind of all right below Canada. There's a, there's a lot of fields up there growing a lot of grains, good and bad. Um, but a lot happening up there for sure. And it's interesting to watch it continue to change. And um, there's, a, there's a farm up there, I think it's called Smalls, and they're like doing this really amazing um, kind of just basic, basic white flower, um, mm -hmm. but doing like good stuff and just kind of reshaping and reframing the way people are thinking about those things, which is really interesting. Yeah. Distribution I find can be a challenge um, because oftentimes the people that are growing those grains are like hyper- regional or they're going to farmer's markets or like they're, you know, they're such small productions that it's like a challenge to say, oh, here's the, the farm I love. And people are like, well, where can I get that? But do you, what are your thoughts on sort of like the general commercial availability of grains these days? 
Um, I think it's a lot better. I think that you can just go on Amazon and like you can find a lot of really cool things. We provide some um, producers that we really like. You know, Anson Mills has been around for an ever and ever and just one of the best. Um, Hayden Mills is another one that I, you know, love, just even love their crackers that they make and all different things. So those are two that I always recommend the most because I think that you can order and support them online for, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, but to your point too, I think more and more people are actually going to farmers markets. And I think that that's the best place to start because when they get excited about things like, you know, and what do you do with these? Like, oh, I make pancakes. Well, that sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. um, and I think learning those things. And I think again, we're just going to see more and more and more coming to farmers markets. Yeah, I hope so. I feel like that's the the number one thing of like, what do you do with this thing? And that's why books like yours are a very, very great resource. Um, I wanted to remind everybody, if you guys have questions, which we're going to start answering soon, pop them into the Q&A, not the chat function. Um, they go into the Q and the A. Mm -hmm. um, if you put it in the chat, you can move it over to the Q&A. Um, that's my housekeeping note. Um, Okay, great. So what is your, I guess, this book to me feels like an obvious continuation mm -hmm. of vegetables. And I, I would imagine if somebody just knew you as an author and hadn't opened the books, they'd be like, does this person even like eat meat? Obviously you love burgers and meats of all sorts and you're a true omnivore. Um, but the idea being that I love that you start with things that are not vegetarian by nature, but are sort of just like more encouraging of eating differently and having like a different lifestyle. And I don't know if that was ever your intention or if it was just sort of a byproduct of your enthusiasm for these types of ingredients, which actually make up a large part of our diet, but right. um, you what? I think I was, I was really inspired because I fell in love with Italian food. And that's, mm. kind of like, that's how the Italian table is. It's really vegetable. It's just bites of things and courses of things. And Grains always play their way in there, whether it's in pasta or a grain salad or both or risotto or all these different things. And so I think that that's where my love of those things came and also not centering around meat, because even at the Italian table, there will be meat, but there'll be very small portions of meat, typically at the end of a meal. Um, so I think that that if I didn't fall in love with Italian food, I don't know how, how I would answer that. So I think it's just that's it's centered around that for sure. That's beautiful. I didn't know that. Very sensitive answer. Sensitive. <laughs> I don't know. It's like a very like romantic sort of like, I, I, I had not put that together, those connections. Well, Cause I you also, have, I love hamburgers. So there's, yeah. <laughs> we know, we know. Um, <laughs> and pepperoni pizza. Um, what, okay, great. I want to start with peppering in some questions from our lovely audience. Um, which you sort of answered already by accident, but do you have thoughts on a third book? Uh, I do, uh, but still just kind of figuring it out. Don't know, really know. In, in the same vein of kind of what's been started with uh, the six season approach and just kind of figure out what feels best for the natural next one. But mm -hmm. definitely love doing them. Um, even though we know how much work they are, they're still yeah. such a, a, a inspiring thing to be a part of. Yeah, they really are a labor of love. Um, but it is, a, it is an absolute thrill to hold a book that you wrote in your hands. So I get it. Um, let's see here. Someone's asking, basically, a natural progression in trying new fruits and vegetables has been to move from purchasing them from the grocery stores to the farmer's markets and then eventually growing them yourselves. Do you feel like that is going to be a new trend and people trying to grow grains themselves? But if so, like how practical is that? And I feel like growing grains is such a highly specialized thing, which makes them interesting and cool. Space. Yeah, it's gonna take up a lot of space. Yeah. Um, I mean, that'd be really cool if that was like all of a sudden starting to try. Well, are, the are there any grains that like you can grow easily? I, I'm trying to think of something and I can't, other than maybe buckwheat, but again, that's a seed. Mm, let's see. Um, I would say I'm not familiar enough with it, um, with grains, growing grains in the way that I was actually physically growing vegetables and being a part of that. Um, you know, so aside from things like corn or, or things like that, that 
I mean, it all requires a lot of space. Every time I visit a farm that I'm excited about, there's one of my favorite farms here that has a lot of really amazing grains in it. It's a lot of space. It's a lot of space for like a handful of grains. Yeah, you're like, oh, that it's like it's like the it's spinach like of farming. Yeah, right. you're like, I started with all this and I get like a tablespoon of that. Right. Right. Um, something I'm not, I don't know the answer to this, um, obviously, but uh, someone wants to you to talk about your work at Bernie Farm and what you're planning to do there. So maybe first I say what Bernie Farm is. And then Bernie farm is a, uh, a 50 acre historic farm that I purchased like four years ago. That's uh, 35 minutes outside of Portland towards the gorge. Um, that has a big old um, barn and house from like 120 years ago and still figuring it out. Uh, there's two amazing farmers there right now, uh, Wild Roots Farm that are, you know, working the land. It was never really necessarily my intent to um, farm farm. It was always kind of like creating a co-op of sorts and letting a lot of other people utilize the land because I love being around it. I definitely have an interest in um, herbs and really like, um, trees a lot. So really interested in like different varieties of nuts, fruit, all different types of things. And then new thing is there's a like a really amazing south uh, facing slope that I would like to put in grains to um, do, I'm sorry, not grains, grapes, um, to do vinegar actually. Ooh, so, nice. But all those things are going to take forever and ever and we just kind of slowly clean it up and the years go by and we're still doing it and going to be doing it for a while so but it's really fun to be able to, to have access to it yeah I imagine also like having a more um long-term sort of permanent thing that isn't reliant on customers or people right. or service like it is like a wild thing that you can kind of tame and cultivate and sort of make the thing that you want it to be for like yeah. so many different parts of your life right. you're, very, you're very like I've never known you to be satisfied like with anything that you're doing in the way that like, you're like, yeah, I have like five restaurants and I'm like writing a second book and then I also do this thing. And you're like, I just, I need more. I need to like do another thing. So it's like, well, of course, you know, have this yeah. farm and you're going to do the thing and you're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to like get really into tin fish and like start a company. Like I could just see you sort of in like the next five years, if we have another, another catch up in five years <laughs> that you've done sort well, of every single thing under the sun you know, hopefully it'll be on the farm I think the farm is something that it's it's always been that's how I grew up and something I've always been inspired by so it's the thing that I'm looking forward to having as like the second half of the things that I'm doing after restaurants and after books um you know ironically it would be would have been great if it was done now because it would make the books easier um but yeah I, I I'm really enjoying tinkering around with it and and trying to figure out how to pull it off because it's a really big project but it feels good and it's I don't know have you ever planted a tree it's a real uh, when I was a kid I used to plant trees at tree people nice so in California to, yeah visit them or you just plant them and like, you're like I did like thanks, a thanks, few thanks. years after that but I haven't gone as an adult and like put my hand on the tree I also wouldn't know where the tree is but I know that they're there and that brings me a lot of joy yeah, there's definitely been brought me a lot of joy. It's just taking care of trees in the last year. I started planting them like a year ago and it was uh, really interesting because I, I remember I like took down this like 80 year old apple tree and like the neighbors across the road were like stopping and taking pictures and probably sending it to the original owner. And I'm just like, this tree is gorgeous and it has a swing and the whole nine yards, but it was like diseased. And I was like, you're a monster. I know, I, like dropped the computer. <laughs> And it needed, it had to go because it was just like almost a liability. So when they started cutting it, was it, sick. It, it was very sick and it didn't really have any like tree left. So like once they cut it, it was completely hollow. And so we had to take down a bunch of trees that didn't really want to, um, but it's been really fun and rewarding planting new trees um, and being really intentional about like the space and the place and how it's going to be and how dramatic of a difference that will be. And two, three, five, 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been, that's been a lot of, a lot of fun. Are you I'm planting any grains? I haven't planted any grains, no. <laughs> too much space. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked how we know each other and if we've ever cooked together. Um, I guess we know each other from me going to, 
did we I think we met I like wrote a story on Dwayne Sorensen in like 2011 or something something crazy like 2013 maybe brunch one yeah yeah that was probably and I came out and I met you then yep and And then then I came back out doing the Ava Jean's top 10 thing and then we've cooked together we cooked together when we're up in Alaska that was amazing but yeah cooked- joshua and i went on a on a fishing trip i guess yeah it wasn't really a fishing trip it's a sensitive subject joshua we were very upset uh no i'm just kidding um we were promised fishing but it was like less fishing and more talking about fish which was very cool but yeah, we went to go see- drinking delicious yeah. food. it was rough remember when yeah. i convinced everyone that we should make a um uh, a uh baked potato bar and then we did and everyone got excited and then i didn't contribute anything you well so the whole the whole trip this is like a sidebar i won't i won't spend too much time on this but the whole trip joshua was basically sleeping and (laughs) so we have like a photo album there were other people on the trip and every photo is just him napping 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 napping. on a bench napping on the boat napping on a couch napping if you could nap on it this man has napped there he loves to nap Um, but yeah but we we like got we caught a fresh salmon and then we it had, it was full of eggs. And so we split it open, saved the egg sack. And it was the first time I had, I like cured the egg sack. We like Googled it when nobody had done it before. <laughs> anyway, it was cool. But so we've cooked together. Mostly I've cooked for Joshua, I guess. Um, Supervised. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Um, okay. Somebody's already read your book cover to cover. Oof. And they love it. Okay, good. I was going to say, and they have some notes. They loved it. Um, Jason says that you use beet pollen a lot in the new book, which I think is cool. And I love the flavor of beet pollen. It's a really interesting flavor that will catch you by surprise. Have you ever had it in chocolate? It's really amazing. I have. I I did a a chocolate tart at Jacobson. Yeah. Sea salt because he they do the bee the they do the bees. Um, and so like I sprinkled beet pollen on top of the chocolate tart. Anyway cool story <laughs> um okay somebody wants to know and this can be dealer's choice but either your favorite recipe from the new book or what's the first recipe you think somebody should make from the new book mm, yikes um i really like the buckwheat um section the best and i think that that's a really fun place to start and a pretty easy place to start um there's a recipe in that buckwheat section that is for I'm trying to find it, but for um, a honey pie, and it's David Leibowitz's honey pie basically. But then when I reach out to him to say I was using it, he's like, "I got it from somebody else," and then that person got it from somebody else, and then the crust is basically um, Barbara Damrush, who is one of the owners of Four Season Farm up in Maine, where I used to work, mm-hmm. and she did this one time, but with like an a quiche um, and it just like literally blew my mind and it's one of the easiest, best things to make. So I would say start there because people that have never really made a dessert or a pie, they can do this because there's it's not a crust. You just literally like toast buckwheat or have kasha and then you just butter a pan, you dump those things in there, make a custard, pour it in there and bake it off. And it's wow. dead simple and super, super delicious. That's so, so fun. I love yeah. that. Yeah. And then the whole section of buckwheat, I think I'm really uh, quite pleased with. Well, you heard it here first, buckwheat, so hot for 2022. <laughs> um, what is your favorite grain to bake with or incorporate in desserts? Or which flour version of a grain rather? Not, not grain like in the way you just described, but like if you're milling something or using it in like a brownie or a cake. That's a good one. Um, what is my favorite? favorite flour milled for a dessert i don't know i think that um it's really fun to kind of mix them up even though you tend to end up sometimes with things that aren't so great um but you learn from there so like starting to understand the percentage of rye flour that you could add to a whole wheat flour that you can also add in some white flour um so it's always kind of trying to find mixes but then it's like you kind of find something great and then it never really works out again because flour changes and things change and but uh probably rye after all that rye flour rye flour is a beautiful grain to bake with mm-hmm. it's also like 
I'm sure you get into this and, and anyone who's baked with alternative flours knows this, but like they all absorb liquid differently. So like to your point, when you, I've like from Anson Mills to Bob's Red Mill to so-and-so, like they're all so different. It can okay. be like really heartbreaking. Like when you're expecting a certain result every time, like consistency is not their strength, I would say. I agree. Um, the process of writing with your co-author, what parts do you do? Like, what's that process like for you? How do you sort of work together? Well, as I said, they wouldn't be done without Martha. Um, I will take an idea and push it around a lot and make it, make notes, pass it off, and then we just keep passing it off. Um, and she does the bulk, if not almost all of the testing and working through that whole thing and then kicks them back to me and then we kind of um, fine tune them. But most times there isn't much to do because she's so good at what she does. Um, as I said, when she's excited about something, I know it's good. When, when she's not, I know it's not. And it's often really fun to kind of just work through that. And then most often during that process, there'll be, a, oh, this is really good. I just wasn't adding enough vinegar or enough salt or I did this step first or something like that. And then um, writing, 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 writing. It wouldn't be done without her. I take care of all the um, styling and kind of producing of the, the photo shoots and the overall idea and, and that type of stuff. Great, I love your teamwork. Little collaborator. Um, if you could be any grain or seed, what would you be and why? Buckwheat. <laughs> because, because it's a seed that thinks it's a grain. <laughs> yeah, and it's you. It really sums you up. And it's also um, uh, related to rhubarb. And rhubarb is one of my favorite things and my first flavor memory in life is rhubarb. Wow. Yeah. Why? What was that memory? Um, my grandmother kicking out of me out of her house and giving me this like sugar pail and I found my way down to the garden and like pulled that out because somebody I thought had showed me like my aunt the next day and I was like down there in the garden like dipping this thing in a sugar pail and eating it in the garden and it was like my mind was literally blown it's an yeah. incredible thing and I feel like most people only have it in jam and it's so undervalued now making it into like a water and then using that water and um you can put the water in granitas or into like whipped cream or I don't know, into a gin and tonic and it's real good. Wow. I would, I would love that. I would love that right now. Are there, there are drinks in the book? Yeah. Uh, no, nothing. No? There's an oat milk, but um, that's it. Hmm. Okay. Fair. Um, if I, you wanted could take, I wanted to. But too much. Just, you have yes. to stop at some point. I was gonna like honestly though, you could it could have been a grains part one, grains part two. I feel like there's so much to say. Great, thank you. But no thank problem. You. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Right. no, I'm sure it's all in there. I'm sure there's no nothing, no stone unturned. I'm sure you really. Well, it's definitely just the just the start. Honestly, it's not like an encyclopedia about things in the same way that, um, you know, six seasons. Martha always likes to point out it never it didn't have um, spinach. You know. Um, and so it's not, it's just like a, a, some of a handful of things that we were interested in and things that we were familiar with and then things we wanted to learn more about. So it certainly doesn't, it doesn't go um, every stone unturned, that's for sure. Well, then it's I take it back. No, all the stones have left, have been left unturned. I've just received word. Um, what is your, if you could take one grain to a desert island, what would it be? One grain to rule them all. One grain to rule them all, probably Faro. So versatile and so delicious. Mm -hmm. And it'd be so, so good with um, all the things you would find on a, on a deserted island with uh, seafood and with all the fruits and all the things. That would be, that'd be the one. That's very it's thoughtful. Favorite. I like that. What would you bring? I want to know what you'd bring. Um, grain. I would probably bring, honestly, I'd probably bring rye because I prefer the texture of it and I prefer the flower of it. And I feel like, I don't know, texture wise, I just, I feel like you could like cook a lot of it, assuming you could make a fire and have a pot. And I just, I like the way that it sits a lot longer. It 
Farro sometimes can get like bloated tasting. Like I, I know if you cook it right, blah, blah, blah. But rye to me has like that squeaky, like, I don't know. It's almost like a nut. I could, like I would use it as a crouton. I would use it as a thing in a salad. I would use it in a stew, whatever I love. I'm going to go farro. Um, do you have opinions on GMO versus non-GMO grains? Um, I think what this question is sort of getting at, like, not sure how much weight to assign to either one, kind of like how sometimes if you're at a farmer's market, there'll be two stands and one will be like, I'm organic. And the other one will be like, I not organic, but I don't use pesticides or sprays. I'm just not certified. Like what is the, what are we paying attention to? And like, how important should it be while we're shopping? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I can circle back if you want to marinate on that, but I think always I'm always wanting um, non-GMO and heritage, heritage varieties of things. And I think there's definitely something to be said about um, not being certified, but having, you know, clean practices. Like I worked on a farm for Elliot Coleman and he literally wrote the new organic farmer, but yet his farm wasn't certified organic. And you always have this, you know, opinion about like it's marketing and it's this and this. And I think we've come to find out that largely that is true. And I think it really just comes down to the idea that people want healthy soils and they're really looking at nutrition and thinking about a full cycle and the world in a healthy, happier place. So yeah, full circle. Yeah. I agree. I think my not that they asked me, but I think also if and when the opportunity arises to like talk to the person you're buying from, like asking them about that, because the the sort of political roadblocking, as it were, to like getting to a certification space, especially with organic and what, you know, it's like farmed fish, like is not always bad. And we got to talk about why and like, who are we getting it from? What are they farming like? Like, you know, GMO versus non-GMO. I think there's a lot there to um sort of educate ourselves on it. It's changing very quickly. So uh, somebody asked me that I like, what is, what is a free range egg versus a free or like a pasture raised egg? And I was like, honestly, could not tell you, couldn't tell you which was better. A lot of it's marketing. Anyway. Marketing, marketing, marketing. I know. Um, somebody, William pointed out that we're both wearing black and white stripes. We did not coordinate. Haven't went to the man in, in a hundred years, but yet here we are showing up in black and white stripes, always connected. (laughs) <laughs> um what is the best way to store grains to maintain freshness mm-hmm. that was a good question i've always thought it was the freezer but maybe that's wrong no i think that's great i think if you can do that that's great um certainly with flowers um but just like you would olive oil like you know in a, in a dark cool place it's not moist and really thinking about like the idea that um how how long has it been in there for like just don't like forget about it because they eventually aren't going to taste great just like nuts or something like that um because there's i also think people forget like it's like a they're not alive but there's like they're they're fresh Mm -hmm. like they're dry but they're fresh so like they do have they spoil they go rancid like i've if you are cooking like you open up a bag like especially if you like farro and rye and and those depending on where you're getting them like they turn rancid almost like a nut does like the oils kind of yeah. turn yeah. on you. Um, what are you, well, I guess I could ask generally speaking, because quarantine is really a quarantine. I feel like is a sixth season right now. Like we are, we cannot quit this. Uh, so quarantine, <laughs> even if we're not quarantining, I feel like it, we, we, we mean the pandemic, which we are still very much in. Um, has there been something that you found yourself cooking a lot, either from one of your own books or something that you borrowed from a book, um, one of your own that you've been returning to again and again? Cooked a lot. That's a good one. Um, I mean, I think it's all been about like comfort, 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 you know, like I, that has always been the thing. Um, again, probably back to fried, um, stir fry grains and things like that. That's one of my like go-tos. Like I love it three, four times a week. Like no kidding, like making meals with that. Um, but that has always been kind of a constant, but again, it's very familiar and nutritious, delicious, quick, easy to clean up. It's one one pan. You can have a whole meal in 15 minutes. So I think, yeah, stir fried grains. Nobody asked this, but I want to know because I feel like there's like an illusion that 
like people that write books or or chefs or do whatever, just like, it's like in their spare time, they're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to like make cassoulet or I'm going to like do this thing. But like, I want to know what's in your fridge right now. Honestly, don't lie. What's in my fridge right now? Um, Is it like, is it like a bottle of Trader Joe's? Um, Trader Joe's has some fun things. There's some borson in there. There's a lot of pickles. Um, and a lot of mustards, a lot of condiments. I mean, you know, that's like that's like the number one. Yeah, got it. Green lettuce, some watercress, some scallions, too many eggs. Um, I think that's kind of it. A bunch of lemons. That's it. I'm satisfied with that answer. That sounds like my my fridge. Um, what was the most challenging part of this book to write? Um thinking that I had any idea what I was doing and realizing I didn't and trying to figure out how, why that was the case and then figuring out how to figure it out so I could actually contribute to the subject. Mm. That took some time for sure. Yeah, just like the bigger picture of like, what is this actually? Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying about like the asparagus far, uh, farro salad. It's like, well, I don't want people to think that that's, how you cook a farro, like it's like one thing. So when I realized that Six Seasons was all about seasons, that it would be weird to then just have that one thing that's like, oh, here's this asparagus salad. So that really, really threw me for a loop that I didn't see that coming. And it was just too impossible to just think that you're gonna be able to follow the same idea of Six Seasons. It was uh, easier for us to pursue the idea of encouraging people to think that way, as opposed to like telling them to do that. So that's, that's like also a personal growth. I feel like, you know, you're like, what's actually important here. It's like <laughs> never just about the book. It's, it's always like oh, growing, getting better. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then to sort of end things, this is like a different beat, but you do, um, I feel like you have been in restaurants for so long and obviously this pandemic has been very tough on the industry. Is there anything, one thing you could, if you had like one wish, for restaurants at large in the industry, what would be sort of the major change you would like to see happen in light of how things went down during this pandemic with, you know, rents or shortages of staff or could, you know, everything? Big um, question, I, but you could. I, you know. Yeah, I think that, it, I don't think we know the full impacts that the pandemic has had on restaurants yet. And I think that it, it will never be the same. Um, and I think that, you know, as I realized very early on that Ava Jeans, for example, wasn't something that needed to come back. Like it wasn't like, it's not gonna change the world really. And I realized that <clears throat> that that restaurant was really not about a meal. It was more about celebrating and, and rejuvenating and meeting up with friends and having a full experience. So I think, and I would, I would imagine that we're really gonna start going to that idea of you're choosing that experience and uh, of an experience like that. And there's gonna be a lot of other experiences that you can choose. That could be going to Sweet Greens for lunch and you don't have to sit down anymore, or you know, Sweet Greens can come to your desk. You don't even have to get up anymore. Um, and you can go to a full service, you know, find any restaurant, whatever that word means anymore. And I think you should expect that you're participating in something that you're choosing for and wanting and that's the experience that you should be trying to achieve. It's again, it's not just like, oh, I'm going out for dinner. It's like, oh, I'm going out to like rejuvenate and experience something. And I think, I would like to think that that's gonna be what's gonna center around because I think prices have needed to go up for a long time and wages have needed to go up for a long time. And it's the whole supply chain. It's not just the restaurants, you know, it's like, how does that egg get in the back door? And mm -hmm. I think that we're hopefully, I would like to think that we're, there's been a shift that's going to change that perspective positively, but it's still not going to fix everything. I think we still have a long way to go, but I think we can at least start understanding there's more choices to be had, hopefully. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you for Hi. that. Thank wow. you so much. This was, I, I've never been on time for anything in my life, and I feel like we really- On time, look at that, it's six o'clock. <laughs> it was perfect. Um, but your book is, you, you are a wonderful cookbook author and people just love what you do. They're so useful. They help so many people cook, not just during the pandemic, but overall. And, um, I think everybody's very grateful for you and that you have a new book out. 
so much for that. I appreciate that. It was really good to see you too. Yeah, so good to see you too. Thank you for matching me. <laughs> that and was Laura, so thank much you fun. again for hosting. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, I both of your you. Oh, thank so you much. Allison. Oh no, we miss you too. We'll see you <laughs> in the next book, I hope, if not yeah. soon. Um, and thank you, congratulations, Joshua. I echo what Allison um, had to say. Six seasons has been a bestseller at Book Larder since it came out, and I expect this one to sort of follow in its footsteps. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We recorded the conversation and so it will be up on YouTube in the next couple of days. We'll send everyone who registered a link. Thank you everyone. And thank you again, Allison and Joshua. Have a lovely evening and stay sure, safe sure. and healthy everyone. You too. Thanks Bye -bye. for coming everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.